Okay, so let's pick up on Nathan's story. You were about to get into treatment choices. Let's first look at the history here. And until recently, it was chemotherapy. Do you want to walk us through that, Ian? Right. I mean, we started, first started with some of these more targeted agents about a decade ago. And frankly, when we saw such amazing results in patients who had relapsed disease that were no longer responding to chemotherapy, it never occurred to me that we would still be using chemo or chemoimmunotherapy, you know, 10 years later. But it's, but, but relatively recently, we have very good evidence that um, no matter what chemotherapy you used, depending whether you're old or young, um, you know, whatever the underlying risk factors are, that large randomized trials where half the patients get chemotherapy and half the patients get a brutinib um, or an abrutinib combination, that those studies have shown that that the abrutinib, the small molecule, the targeted agent, the non-chemotherapy drug is superior or at least as good as any chemotherapy um, regimen, no matter what group you're in. And so it's amazing to me it's taken this long, I, I, you know, it's, it's the, to, to get where we are. But um, these days I think that for the vast majority of people, um, they're going to they're, they're gonna get um, one of the BTK inhibitors or another small molecule uh, targeted agent and not chemotherapy as frontline. You know, you brought up a very important point right at the beginning. How do we know that these new therapies in the upfront previously untreated patient are important are from clinical trials? And it's only through the courage of our patients to join well-designed clinical trials where we're trying to figure out what is the best approach um, that we're gonna actually solve some of these questions. But that takes time. So it might be obvious, but we have to prove that that the toxicities and the efficacy, the effect of it are, are you know, in favor of the new therapy over the old therapy. And it's not always, I mean, in, I mean, it seemed obvious to me that this was going to be better, but in reality, that's not true. I mean, I have my own biases, right? I work with these drugs, I see it happen, but it's not until you test it in much larger patient populations that have you know, people that are young, people that are older, people that have uh, illnesses, people that are otherwise in good health, that you can really tease out some of these, um, some of these subtle differences. And we did, even, even though my bias was that these drugs were gonna be, be better, and we did learn that, unfortunately, there are, there are side effects that are associated with some of these medications in the long term, and they have to be um, taken into account as well. So, Camille, this is something that actually oncology nursing as a as a practice has had to deal with, in general, in all of oncology, moving from infusional, cytotoxic, tough chemotherapy to oral regimens. Mm -hmm. What's that been like? What have you seen with patients in terms of when you were an infusion nurse as opposed to now? Well, um, you know, we, I guess not for CLL, but we still do quite a bit of infusion nursing for some of the other, you know, infusions for some of the other um, lymphomas, but um, typically the oral the oral drugs are much more well tolerated. You know, the patients are not going to lose their hair, which is a big, especially for I mean for everybody, especially for women, that's a big question that we get. Um, also, I, I feel like the GI toxicities are not as bad. You can certainly have GI toxicities, especially when you're taking more than one oral, um, you know, chemotherapy but they're not nearly as bad as with some of the IV chemotherapies that we give. Um, also, when we're kind of preparing patients to go on treatment, I try to tell them they're not gonna have every single side effect, right? Because <laughs> I'm like, you're not gonna have everything I want. Let's just start with that, you know, if I'm talking about it, because it's just very overwhelming. And especially if, if, if it's someone that, that we're having to start sooner rather than later that haven't had time to absorb what's going on, they are very overwhelmed, you know, especially when you have patients that are newly diagnosed, they can't believe that they, that they have cancer to begin with. And then now we're putting them on therapy. Um, you know, it's important to try to walk them through and let them know they're not gonna get everything and that, you know, it's okay to not absorb all of this right now. <laughs> you know, they can ask questions later, right? Mm -hmm. That we're here to help them through it. So Doreen, what are some of the challenges for our patients going from time-limited infusional chemotherapy that's given in a doctor's office mm -hmm. to getting pills as an outpatient that are quite expensive and yes. are charged in a, to our patients in a different way? Yeah, I'm in a clinical trial, so the drugs are provided. 
which is a huge benefit. And it's a concern for everybody. Um, we see these drugs having such a, a great impact on, on survival and progression-free survival and limited toxicities. And we all want them. And then it's like, now how do you get them? A clinical trial is great. It, it adds to the science. It, it uh, provides the, the drug for a greater number of people. And, um, <clears throat> and if your insurance company um, will cover these drugs, is, it's important to know if your insurance company will cover these drugs. And there are grants and other copay assistance programs that usually the cancer center nurse practitioners can help you find financial folks at your treatment institution. The CLL Society lists these organizations. LLS has copay assistance grants. Um, there are patient access network grants. And it's good to uh, find the broad range of, of these organizations that provide these grants. And you can do that as an individual. You can do it through your cancer institution. The CLL Society lists them. So to find all of your options, and it's different for everybody. Uh, if you're on Medicare, if you're not on Medicare. So you really have to find out what your particular situation is. And I've found that it's difficult to project that. You can't, until you're there, it's kind of hard to find out what you have access to. You think maybe your income limitations will stop you from qualifying for a particular grant, but that's not always the case. So it, it's nice to plan ahead and be aware, but you won't know what applies to you until you sort of get there. So, Ian, I'll put you on the spot then. So it, we used to call it immunochemotherapy, right? Antibodies against the cells and chemotherapy. Is that out? Um, for fir first line therapy? I think for the vast majority of patients, um, it's out. There are, there are some very niche populations of patients who have very um, uh, unusual characteristics that people still argue about it. But, but I have to say, when I talk to patients and you say, you know, would you rather get chemotherapy or would you rather get uh, a pill? I mean, there isn't, a lot of, there isn't a lot of discussion. I mean, it doesn't go very long when people say, I don't want the, the chemotherapy. The, advantage, the only advantage of chemotherapy in the, is in the, that it's, it's an episode of care. It's, it's six months of treatment and you're done um, for a while, um, at any rate. And so there's a there's a rare patient that that's um, that that might be an important um, uh, characteristic. However, in our current uh, generation of clinical trials, we're now looking at ways of using combinations of these oral medications, um, these targeted therapies, to once again go back to that time limit therapy. So it's not so um, daunting to say you're going to take this pill for the rest of your life. Um, being able to say you're going to take it for a year. Um, is is much more palatable, much more attractive. Today. Yeah, th this is a, a really important discussion about how chronic the therapy is, because as you know, it, you know, leukemia doctors. Uh, I'm an acute leukemia doctor, and I always laugh at the um, papers that are written saying that some new therapy was relatively well tolerated. Well, it's relative to what <laughs> intensive chemotherapy is like for patients, and. Um, but it, there are still side effects and they can be chronic. And so, as you point out, this move to making it a time-limited therapy by combining agents is really critical for our patients with CLL.